We're going to transition now to the Word. For those of you who are just joining us, we are in the midst of a series of messages which we've entitled Reflections on the Psalms. And our plan is that uh, each time I share just a little background about the Psalms and then we actually look at a particular Psalm. And so I'm going to do that again today. We're going to be looking at Psalm 2. You know what, could we shut that door, please? Thanks, Lori, I appreciate that. We're going to be looking at Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is what is known as a royal psalm. The royal psalms emphasize God as king, often using the words, the Lord reigns. These psalms speak of his rule as creator, as savior of Israel, and as the coming one. That's what a royal psalm is. The royal psalms often point forward to the coming rule of the Savior King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, with that background, we're going to look at this psalm. It has 12 verses, and they neatly divide into four sections, verse 3, second 3, third 3, and fourth 3. It starts out, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves And the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Now, just a couple things about these royal psalms and about this one in particular. We're going to see in a moment that in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, as Peter is speaking, he cites this psalm and he cites it as being written by David. And as we read the psalm, it has some application to David, but very clearly it has application to David's greater son, the Messiah, Jesus. And so if you look, it starts out, why do the nations rage? It could be like a roaring lion or like the raging sea. The people plot a vain thing. And of course, that's a classic Hebrew parallelism, meaning it kind of says the same thing in parallel, but it's slightly different. And so it kind of draws your attention, gives some emphasis. But they're plotting. They're thinking about that. And yet the thing that they're plotting is ultimately vain. It's futile. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. So this isn't just mere kind of -of run-of-the-mill rebellion. This is with forethought and malice. Oh, would to God that the people of God would take such counsel and forethought and how they're going to serve the Lord as the heathen do in taking counsel against the Lord and against his anointed Hebrew Mashiach, from which we get Messiah. The Greek Septuagint translation of the Hebrew into Greek is uh, Christos, anointed. And so kings priests, and sometimes even prophets, were anointed. Oil was poured on their heads as they were set into their office. And so God has set his king, his anointed, in place. And yet the cry of these people is, let us break their bonds in pieces. Let us cast away their cords from us. We don't want them ruling over us. The crowds cried out when they were crucifying Jesus, we will not have this man to rule over us. Caesar's our king. This is just a window into the unregenerate human heart that that deep, deep down, it says in Psalm, no, Proverbs 19.3, the heart of man rages against the Lord. Deep down, there is a, in the unregenerate heart, there is a seething, there is a rebellion against the Lord. And People can talk about spirituality, God, however you define her, and we just keep it all kind of fuzzy, cotton candy-ish, will-o'-the-wispy, nail jello to the wall, can't really define it. But when we talk about the God of the Bible, this is the one who gives tablets of stone that says, thou shall not commit adultery and steal and do other such things. And the rebellious human heart doesn't want that. Steve, I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Think about your kids. Come here. No. And we never fully grow out of that. There is this thing, whether it's the parent or the ultimate heavenly parent, there is something that I don't want them to rule over me. 
Now, in the context, as David comes to royalty and God says he's going to give him all the nations surrounding him, these nations don't like that. And there's, we can read about in the books of Samuel and Chronicles that various armies try to come up against David, but God gives David victory over his enemies. But these enemies don't want David to be ruling. And this has larger applications as we see going into the New Testament in Acts chapter 4, starting at verse 24. It says, when they heard that, that is, Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 had prayed for a man who had been lame in his feet for over 40 years. He was totally healed. The powers that be, the Sanhedrin, took Peter and John into custody They heard them out, and they forbade them from preaching in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John said, we're not going to do that. And Peter and John came back to the gathered company of disciples and shared what they said, what the authorities said. And when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said... Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed Mashiach, Messiah, Christ. And of course I have in white and in italics this direct quote from Psalm 2. So here they are seeing what the Romans did, what Herod did, and yes, what the people of Israel did. And they they saw in this a fulfillment of Psalm 2. By the way, Psalm 2 is arguably the most frequently quoted passage in the New Testament. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, there it is, anointed, Mashiach, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now, I gave that extended passage from the New Testament because it's instructive to us that here we have in the law, in the prophets, in the Psalms, those three great divisions of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, we find Jesus. All of the scriptures point to Israel's Messiah, who is Yeshua of Nazareth, is Jesus of Nazareth. And when Jesus rose again from the dead, he had Bible studies with his apostles and showed them in every place where he was mentioned. And so the early church was energized by the scriptures and even found guidance from the Scriptures in what they were to do in various situations. And this is instructive for us, because guess what? The heathen are still raging. Why do the nations rage? The people plot a vain thing. Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Do I need to spell it out that there are people and groups of people, and structures within our government that are not merely neutral, but anti-Christian. And they are passing legislation against the Lord and against His ways and His principles and His rules. Harry, I knew it. We walked in one of these politically conservative... This pulpit is above politics, but the stuff we do brushes into all of life, which includes politics. And we're naive if we don't think that this dynamic that has rolled all through history, the Old Testament, whether it's Antiochus Epiphanes in 168 BC trying to wipe out the people of God, or whether it's Diocletian who is persecuting the church circa 95 AD, it's just an unbelievable uh, uh, attack on Christians, and there were even coins being struck saying the Diocletian wiped out the Galileans. I mean, there's always been this attempt to wipe out the people of God. 
Mao Zedong comes to power in China in 1949, kicks out all the missionaries and was killing all the Christians or imprisoning them. Watchman Nee was imprisoned in 1951, died in prison in 1972. This dynamic of the peoples in general, but even the kings, don't want the living God to rule or his Messiah. Now, we come into the next triplet of verses. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. This is what a marvelous passage. God laughing. Now, let me say (laughs) that The Bible talks about joy. The Bible talks about joy of the Lord. Jesus said, I share these things with you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. So did Jesus ever laugh? Probably, although the New Testament doesn't say that, but I have no problem with people imagining Jesus laughing. But sometimes people say, you know, the Bible says that God laughs. (laughs) He does, but you don't really want this kind of laughter coming from God. And, and, what, and because we're made in his image, we all have a familiarity with laughter, don't we? What, what, what triggers laughter? When there's an incongruity, when you see uh, a whole bunch of uh, Keystone cops trying to crowd into a little tiny car or whatever, it, it's something that's, that's in, it doesn't fit, it doesn't make sense. And so we, our, our natural response, when we hear something that's out of place, we... <laughs> Well, God sees the machinations of the people and kings are plotting and we will, but we don't want to cast off his. I mean, again, this is your little, this is David Rasmussen. I'm going to say about six foot two and slim down, so I can't even begin to guess his weight, but he is in tip-top shape. And you've all seen little Joel. He's got a pretty good set of lungs on him. But the joke, no, no, ah! I don't know if we can articulate no yet. Maybe he's getting there. But no, ah! David, who stands in the heavens, <laughs>, laughs. This little pipsqueak's going to somehow defy him. And God is infinitely bigger. And we do need to keep this perspective that, Pastor Steve, do you know what they're doing now? Do you know what I just heard? Do you know what Planned Parenthood? Do you know what the Obama administration? Do you know what? And you can fill in the Bush administration and uh, various things that were happening the conservatives were doing and taking away our liberties, homeland security. So this is a, do you get this? This is apolitical. There's the nations and then there's the kingdom of God. So this is not a rant against the current administration or the the Democrats versus the Republicans, but we're talking, we're in a Christian church, we're talking Bible, and we are talking truth that we are to be the people of God and there are ragings going on. But as Clark Gable said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And God hears the ragings and machinations of people and he laughs. It's, it's, it's contempt. It is derision. He shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. What is his response? Yet, we'll not have this man rid of We want his anointed. We don't want the Lord breaking pieces of body. Yet, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Zion. That was the ancient stronghold that the Jebusites occupied. It was the perfect place for David's kingdom. David came up, saw the place, and says, whoever captures the stronghold of the Jebusites, he shall be chief. Joab shimmies up a water shaft with a few others, gets inside, kills all the Jebusites, and takes it over. That stronghold, which was the stronghold of the enemy that had lasted there for thousands of years, defying the dictum of God who said, I've given all the land, and yet... Benjamin tried to get it. Judah tried to get it. We read of this in the book of Judges. Nobody could get it. So the Jebusites dwell in the land to this day. They had been there forever and ever and ever. David says, get them. He comes to kingship. Boom, they're out. David takes over the stronghold of the Jebusites and calls it Sion. It's hard to know exactly what the translation is, but probably just means mountainous ridge or high place. He takes over that place 
And what's really important for us is how the Bible uses Zion. It uses it as the center of God's presence. Because see, on that Mount Zion, David pitched a tent, brought the Ark of the Covenant up, put it in that tent, and assigned music worshipers and singers to be worshiping before the Lord 24-7, and the direct presence of God was there. And that became known as Zion. Zion's a place where God dwells. And I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. And the New Testament tells us that we, who are believers in Jesus, have come unto Mount Zion. Now, in this case, we're not talking about the physical land in the Middle East, but in some spiritual way, we have come into a place of the presence of God, of the reign of God, of the rule of God. And he has set his king on his holy hill of Zion. And this is God speaking. God the Father, I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. Of course, at the time, it's speaking of, I've placed David. Despite what all you nations say, I've placed David, but there will come a greater David, the Lord Jesus. And then we have David, and ultimately Jesus, the greater David speaking, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. So here David is telling us what the Lord had promised him. And actually then we're going to see this rolls over into the Lord Jesus. Now first we want to look at this dynamic. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Wow. What's this all about? Well, we see in 2 Samuel chapter 7, David had in his heart to build God a house, but Nathan the prophet said, you want to come and build a house for God? No, God's going to build you a house. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. He's speaking to, this is Nathan speaking to David, ultimately the word of the Lord. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so the idea here, this is a very important concept. and We can't linger on this too long. But even the earthly kings of Israel were called sons of God. I'm their father, and they are my son, and they are representing my people, Israel. I mean, even at one place, he calls all of Israel his son. Out of Egypt, I've called my son, Hosea 11.1. 1. But the kings were called sons of God. And therefore, when Jesus comes on the scene and is referred to as the son of God, I know because of 2,000 years of church history and church theology, we tend to think, oh, Son of God, God the Son, so that's talking of Jesus' deity. There's plenty of support for Jesus' deity in the New Testament, that Jesus is God. But the title Son of God is really more of a royal title. It's a title to his kingship, his messiahship. And believe it or not, the title Son of Man, which you might think, oh, Son of Man speaks of Jesus' humanity, Son of God speaks of his divinity, it's, it's almost the reverse. As son of God, he is a royal of the, the royal lineage of the line of David. He has a right to be king in the earth. But the son of man is that heavenly being found in Daniel chapter 7. So in Ezekiel chapter 1 in the visions, that is the heavenly messenger who will come. So when it speaks of the one who's the son of man, that's really speaking of that heavenly being who will come incarnate into the earth. So son of God, when you see that, it's speaking of the royal lineage of David. We find the same thing in Psalm 89, 26 to 29. David, speaking of David, he shall cry to me, you are my father, my God and my rock and my salvation. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for him forever and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his offspring forever and his throne as the days of the heaven. This became known as the sure mercies of David, the covenant promises to David that his, of the increase of his government, there should be no end. There will always be a descendant of his on his throne. And even the rabbis themselves understood that of ultimately being fulfilled by one who would to come, one who would come, the Messiah. 
not just a Messiah, not just a anointed one, but the ultimate one who would come. So here it is. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. And we find this then picked up again in the New Testament. In Acts 13, Paul is preaching. And he says, and we declare to you glad tidings that the promise which was made to the fathers, God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he has raised up Jesus. As it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So Paul is applying this to Jesus when? At his resurrection. At his resurrection and ascension, he is installed as the king over all. Follow that? So you are my son, today I have begotten you. By the way, a little aside for you Bible students and budding theologians, there has long been a discussion in the church about the eternal generation of the Son, that from all eternity was the Father forever begetting the Son, and sometimes they've wanted to use these Bible verses. Whatever we want to think about this highfalutin philosophic concepts and constructs of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, this passage has very little to do with that. This is speaking of the son of David, in the same way that it was spoken to David, now it's being spoken to his greater son, the Lord Jesus, who's now being installed in the heavenly Zion to rule and reign when Jesus was raised from the dead. Hebrews chapter 1, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Hebrews 5, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So you can see that the writers of the New Testament really picked up on this Psalm 2 and this dynamic of, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And now one other passage, a different passage now that was cited in Psalm 2, Revelation chapter 2, the risen Christ says in verse 26, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel. That's what we just saw in Psalm 2. As I also have received from my Father. Now this is heavy duty. We said that Psalm 2 has application to David, right? It has application to the greater David, Jesus but now Jesus says, those who are in me, I'm the head, you are the body. The things I have received from my Father, I am now passing on to you. So that those who overcome, he that overcomes, he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So that we can participate in Christ's rule. Because of the incarnation, because of death, burial, and resurrection because of our identity in Christ, in some very careful way, we have to be careful how we apply this, but therefore even the things in Scripture that apply to Jesus in some sort of way filtered through Him come down upon us who are His body. And so 2 Corinthians 1, 20, 1 says, all the promises of God, whatsoever they be, they are yes and amen in Christ. Christ Jesus. So there's a lot loaded here. Ask of me, God says, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. He spoke that to David, but boy, David never got to the ends of the earth. But if we look at Jesus, the nations are becoming his inheritance as one by one, every ethnos, every ethnic group, every people group is coming to Christ in significant numbers. It's been happening through history, but it's being accelerated in our day. And now we come to the final triplet. What's the end of the matter? Remember those rebellious people back at the beginning? Now therefore, be wise, O kings. You shouldn't be taking counsel together against the Lord and against His Christ. Don't do that. Rather, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Steve, what should we do? Should we rejoice or should we tremble? Yes. 
a little wisdom from Matthew Henry three centuries ago. There must ever be a holy fear mixed with Christian's joy. This is a sacred compound. Oh, I love that. Wish I would have said that. Yielding a sweet smell. And we must see to it that we burn no other upon the altar. Fear without joy is torment. And joy without holy fear would be presumption. And how many of you know we've seen both kinds throughout church history? The dour, I'm a Christian, Middle Ages, we're flagellating ourselves. Drab clothes, we're not worldly. Or in other quarters, and I see a lot of this, there's sort of this glib, <laughs> daddy, I'm just tripping into the throne. He is daddy. He is Abba. We have access. But there's a, may I suggest to you that there is a sacred compound and we must see that we burn no other on the altar. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Kiss the son lest he be angry. Of course, this is the kiss of obeisance of, you know, like the Pope and you kiss the ring or a king extends and you come on your knees and you kiss. I mean, at one level, that's exactly what it's talking about. But, and of course, remember though, there's also a dynamic of the kiss is a kiss of friendship. Judas came and identified Jesus in the garden, remember, with a kiss. And Jesus said, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? But once Jesus has come, as it were, in his mercy and kissed us, as the Shunammite woman cried in Song of Solomon, oh, that I could be ravished with his kisses. The church has often prayed that, that we could receive his kiss. Once we've been kissed with the kiss of mercy and grace, then our kisses are no longer the cowering obeisance, but we come and kiss in friendship and in love. And that's the invitation that comes to all of us. But but we need to do that. The Bible, again, cover to cover, Old Testament, New Testament. We saw in Psalm 1, the wicked are not sober like the chaff that the wind drives away. You take the grain, you thresh it, separate the kernels from the outer husk, and then you throw it up in the air, and the wind blows that light little chaff just away, and eventually gets burned up. Here we have potter's vessels. When you take a a clay pot, and smash it. It just shatters into a billion pieces. You can never put it back together again. Both testaments just tell us you don't want to be on the wrong side of this equation. You want to be in the place of blessedness. Blessed are those who put their trust in Him. Remember Psalm 1? Blessed is the man who walks not in the council... Psalm 1 begins with a blessing. Psalm 2 ends with a blessing. And there's a blessing available for all of us who put our trust in Him. Can we stand, please?